Uh, we have uh, Council Nathan Zambroglo uh, in the studio today to talk about some different matters. Um, uh, we've got a fair bit to talk about, Nathan. Good to see you again. Gary, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and, of course, we've got a bit to get through because uh, we're not happy on a lot of fronts, <laughs> <laughs> mainly with the state government, but, uh, you know, and then some of the things they uh, they talk about. Now, what one of the, I know we have a few matters to talk about. One of the main ones, though, is the public notice about a, the development of a uh, industrial crusher at 88 uh, Sergeant's Road, Ebenezer, uh, right next to my back door and a lot of other people's back door. That was very concerning. We've had a meeting there last year and we had uh, Susan Teltman, uh, Councillor Wheeler. There was quite a few people there. There was probably 100 people on the day. Very concerned about this uh, coming into Hawkesbury. We don't think that's industrial. Uh, 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 woodlands at Wilberforce is industrial area. Now they're starting to come down Spanish, Spanish Park Road, and this one's this one it will um, you know just kill the sanctity of the whole Ebenezer region, close to uh, the school as well, 400 metres. Uh, so uh, you, you were saying, Nathan, you have some more information there because I know you've got your, had your finger on the pulse with this. No, look, I've tried to follow this as closely as I can, despite the fact that council isn't responsible for yes, the approval or otherwise. That, yeah. Under new state government legislation, all of this gets devolved to a planning panel. And you and I have spoken about planning panels before. Yes. I'm not really a fan of planning panels. I don't think that they're terribly democratic. They may have bureaucrats that have subject expertise about planning, but they're not democratically accountable. If they make a decision that people don't like, there's no accountability in that sense. And often the panels are populated by people who don't live in the area and have no skin in the game with their respective communities. But it is true that uh, last year there were two DAs that were lodged in Sergeant's Road, Ebenezer. One for alterations to a, a dwelling on that site. That DA has now been withdrawn because of some defects in that DA. The remaining one that we're talking about, uh, I've heard referred to in a, a couple of different ways. Uh, I call it a concrete recycling plant. That seems to capture, you know, the scale and noise that would be right. uh, in that kind of development. And uh, it's now, finally, after a lot of back and forth, set for a planning panel meeting. The Sydney West Planning Panel have it scheduled for their meeting of the 22nd of February. And that's when they make a decision. Now, what's really crucial here is that council still has a role in the sense that council still processes the DA and writes a report about the merits of the DA. Right. And council staff provide a recommendation about whether the DA should was compliant or non-compliant with the terms of the, the planning code. It doesn't come to the councillors. We don't get to vote on it. That sticks in my craw, but it's the system that the state government have imposed on us. That report has only recently gone up on the website of the planning panel, so it's a public document, so people can download that and they can read it. And it recommends a deferral. It's not exactly a conclusive answer. There are still so many issues relating to that DA that have been flagged to me uh, by a number of people, how much fill is proposed on the site, the land use conflicts, the loss of vegetation, the noise, the dust, the traffic movements yeah. and so forth. The people from my end, uh, um, Paul Lawrence, if you listen, he's done a great job uh, putting uh, his uh, recommendations through why it shouldn't go ahead. And then, the, like we've asked for about 80 requests about um, different things, noise, uh, emissions of uh, you name you name it, runoff with water, and we had not had one reply. That's that, that's unfortunate. But what I can say is that the document that's recently gone up on the 4th of February to the planning panel's website says that there are still these ongoing issues, and rather than to recommend for an outright refusal, says, well, look, the applicant has another opportunity to amend their DA or to address these concerns, and then it can come back to the planning panel yet again. That creates months of further uncertainty for that community. Yep. I, I hear that, I feel that yes, with sure. them. Um, but the, the issue will not be resolved on the 22nd of February. The planning panel, of course, can do whatever they like. They may choose to close the door on this and to say, we think these defects are irremediable. But the council's recommendation, at least, is to defer the matter and allow other information to come forth from the applicants. And that's about as much as can be said about that at the moment. So, so council has got to say, they will say, well, in our, in our view, 
this shouldn't go ahead or there's not enough information or they haven't answered the relevant questions about uh, well, the impact of it? You know, this, this opens a can of worms. So, for example, there have been other matters that have come before planning panels where the Chamber, collectively, may have wished to have quite a strong view, but the council staff are obliged to look at this per the letter of planning law and simply adjudicate whether it's permissible or not permissible by the various criteria. So if there was a situation where the uh, a, a development was permissible by the exact work, but there were very many other reasons why it wouldn't be appropriate for the community, and this is the reason why we have a balance between bureaucracy and democracy, in the sense that simply because something is contemplatable doesn't mean that it is entirely appropriate for that community, which is why anything goes to any legislature. Um, otherwise, you'd simply let the state be run by bureaucrats. We have no say uh, at the moment. And if the council oars were resolved to be opposed to something and the council report was resolved to be in favour of something, we'd be at odds. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a ridiculous situation. If, if the council decided that something should be done and the planning panel knocked it down and then the applicant took them to court, it would be council that would have to defend that action, even though council right. would be, in effect, arguing against the recommendation that they had made in the first instance. It becomes terribly complicated. Our contention, and I'm not alone in this, is that planning panels uh, may have been appropriate in some councils where there was a real risk of corruption. We could name some councils in the inner west of Sydney, for example, where some councillors who were also developers did this for their own gain and not for the best interest of the community. Hawkesbury Council is not that kind of council. Um, and we think that, um, like other councils outside the Sydney metropolitan area, we should have retained our planning powers. But it is what it is. And we'll, I'll continue to make that case wherever I can. And the planning powers, just this, this panel, is that just something come in like, like last year, was it? Or has that been in no, place for a while? No, it was an initiative early in this term uh, of, of uh, well, let's say about 2017. So I was elected in 2016. And we enjoyed about a year under the old system where we could sit in judgment on various DAs and then the state government took those planning powers away from us. And that's a shame. And every other council? Most other councils in the Sydney metropolitan area, not all councils outside Sydney are bound by these rules. It was seen as a Sydney problem. Right. Yeah, it's a great shame. Yeah, maybe a money problem for the government too mm. because they stand too well. Yeah. Now, there's, there's so much other stuff I could be talking about and I'm very keen to bring to your listeners some uh, uh, events in, in local government. And we've had a wonderful Australia Day uh, citizenship and award ceremony. We've honoured some local people and organisations for their good work in the community. Uh, I'd like to call out uh, our new Citizen of the Year, David Ryan, who has 48 years of service with the Rural Fire Service. 48? Wow. I know, it's a, it's, a it's, it's, it's a long time. And I thought it was... I'm a member of the selection committee right. for our citizenship uh, awards, and I thought it was entirely appropriate to recognise him and, indeed, the entirety of the local Hawkesbury RFS as our community organisation of the year for the work that they did to keep this community safe sure. over the last 12 months. Because it's only 12 months ago that we were dealing with the most terrible fires and then a flood and they were they were in the vanguard and they, they really put it on the line. So it was wonderful to be able to honour David Ryan, uh, also wonderful to honour our, um, our young citizen of the year, Sam Bonus, who's a keen swimmer. He's 15 years old. I know Sam well. He's been oh, in the studio a couple of times. He's actually my neighbour, or he was my neighbour. He's, he's a strapping young man yeah, and, a, and a real a real inspiration to the community. And I, sure. I, I think his swimming career will go wow. far. Yeah. And to have him as a local, I think, is a I great... I think he was going to do the channel, wasn't he? The English channel. He's That's right. That was, his, that, was his next, that was his next one. And good on him. I think he'll do it. Oh, for sure. Uh, our volunteer of the year, Susie Samuel, who's re raised, on average, about $30,000 a year for the cause of legacy, uh, legacy including yeah. the Legacy Ball, which I have some small association yeah, with. Great charity. Our local hero, Karen Stuttle, in her community kitchen, uh, the uh, Environmental Award to Wise. So some really good people that we're honouring. And although we did it under reduced circumstances this year, we couldn't have 
a gathering as large as we'd have wanted and it was live streamed for the people that couldn't be there, our heart is still very much to recognise those people that contribute to our, our community. So that was a really that was a really good thing. Another thing that I wanted to bring up was, see, I wear a couple of hats. I'm on Hawkesbury Council, but there's another body called the Hawkesbury River County Council. Right. It's one of those things that a lot of people have heard of, but they don't quite know what it does. No, I've never heard of it myself. It's, well, it's been around since 1948. It All goes right. like this. The care of our waterways crosses boundaries. The river doesn't care that it's gone from the Penrith area into the Hawkesbury area. It's just the river. So there was a four council area defined by Penrith Council, Hawkesbury Council, Blacktown Council and Hills Council. And we represent, oh, I think it's like 800,000 citizens. And all of those councils send delegates to the Hawkesbury River County Council and its remit is waterway health and weed control used to be under the Noxious Weeds Act, now we've upgraded it to the Biosecurity Act. Right. And it does really uh, frontline work to keep our waterways healthy, to monitor water quality, to do weed control, terrestrial weed control, and uh, aquatic weed control. So where you see where the river's like full of weed, we've got aquatic weed harvesters and we've got experts and we've got an enormous reservoir of skill, uh, including some really innovative techniques. One of the best friends in getting rid of salvinia is a weevil, tiny little bug. Right. We, we breed these weevils and we turn them loose and they eat the salvinia. Oh, that was a big problem, wasn't there a couple of years? That's years right. Back? We've oh. got we've got photos in the in the boardroom at HRCC, which is based here in South Windsor. It's right. not far mm. um, of the river before and after, and it's like chalk and cheese. Uh, we're used to having a clear river now because the HRCC does such really good work. I have the honour of being the chairman of the Hawkesbury River County Council at this time. I've been there for two terms, two years, uh, and uh, it does really, really good work, and I want to bring it to a, a higher public profile. Unfortunately, we've had some problems with our funding lately. Uh, the state government cut some of our funding, and that means that some of the on-the-ground activities that we would like to do, we are at risk of losing. And that's really unfortunate because if you cast your mind back nearly exactly 12 months, there was that flood and our huge weed harvester. It's a beast. Yeah, in often. fact, in fact, we call it the Weedosaurus. <laughs> it's a huge aquatic vehicle with a kind of a scoop at the front and the kind of like a paddle wheel sort of track, track wheel. And it, yeah, it, the... it goes through and it draws the weed up and it dumps it into a hopper and then we get rid of it. And we keep our waterways nice and clean. Really important at the moment. We've got Olympic rowers and rowing societies on the river up at the Nepean end towards Penrith that are training for the Olympics. They're counting on us to keep the river clear so that they can train for the Tokyo Olympics. They got a grant, I think I've seen um, Robin Preston's little photo thing or the newsletter that she sent out. I think they so, got a so, pretty good Okay grant. then, so the, so the paddle club here at Windsor got a grant to build grant. a new clubhouse, but this is, yeah. the, ah, yeah. this is the rowing club at Penrith. Right. Now unfortunately, this cut a funding will mean that we can't do that work. And uh, I'm using this venue to say that the state government should review that decision. Um, we actually got uh, $130,000 of federal money after the flood to recommission our Weedosaurus. It pulled its mooring in the flood 12 months ago right. and it sank near Penrith Weir. Right. So we got good federal money to send the Weedosaurus all the way up to Newcastle and have it properly refurbished and it was ready to be put back onto the water and then the state government announced that we had no funding to actually do the work. So I'm really hopeful that uh, we'll be able to uh, have that decision reviewed and I've, I'm working closely with our state MP, Robin Preston, who's been very active in this area, uh, Melissa McIntosh, Stuart Ayres, uh, Maurice Payne over in the, the, Pen the Penrith area to see if we can have that funding decision uh, reviewed because otherwise it makes a mockery of the fact that we get federal money to fix something and then and the state way. government pulls the money for the staff to actually run it. Well, the, you know, there's money for so many different things that I was, you know, Robin Preston had that little catalogue that everyone in Hawkesbury got. There was money for just about everyone and why couldn't there be money for something important like this? Like yeah. Like Olympians. And, like, and the thing is, uh, our communities and especially the Hawkesbury community because of how many waterways we've got in our LGA get a fantastic deal out of the Hawkesbury River County Council. 
the ratepayer contribution to its operations traditionally is around 50%, which means that the remainder comes from these other grants that we use, and we have enormous economies of scale because we're doing it over a four council area to do that good work. Unfortunately, if they don't hold up their end of the bargain, that means that the ratepayers are either carrying a more significant burden, that ratepayer contribution has gone up to about 60% and it could go higher still, right. or we lose that capacity, which means that we lose that capacity from the Penrith Council area, the Hawkesbury Council area, Blacktown and, and Hills. Um, so that's just something that we're putting on the radar and there'll probably be more in the media about this. So you're not going to let it go. And so how, how do you go about that? You just well, what we re need to do, resubmit something? What we need to do is we need to sit down with the State Agriculture Minister, Adam Marshall, and put to him the case that HRCC does excellent work and that this decision is, is short-sighted. And we are given to understand that there is money floating around out there. It's just that the allocation process yeah. has become broken. So what, what money are we looking at? You've got to so it's, so it's $238,000 that we've lost in this year right. uh, when we were already dealing with the effects of COVID and that could potentially result in a loss of staff, a loss of expertise. We spent a lot of effort in training up staff uh, so that they know their job and environmental protection is a scientific discipline like, like any other and we're really, really proud of our staff who'd done it tough over the course of 2020 Yes. And then to be facing this at the end of last year was an additional blow. So that's just something that I wanted to bring to your listeners' uh, attention. The other things that I could talk about uh, that have been in the news is council have reformed its committee structures. Here's the thing. Things have a certain inertia. Council committees tend to grow like weeds in a garden. So somebody thinks that it's a good idea for somebody to sit down and talk about X. And eventually we ended up with 17 different council committees of one sort or another. Some are statutory committees that we've got to have. Some are committees that we convened. Some are convened for a specific purpose once a year, like our audit committee and so forth. But uh, it was becoming a, a bit unwieldy and it was chewing up too much of our staff time. And it didn't seem to be very goal-oriented either in the sense that Committees should be there to assist the chamber in its decision-making um, capacity. So what we did is we put through a package of reforms, which I was happy to support uh, in the end with some small amendments, to ensure that our council committees were efficient, that they weren't taking up too much of our staff resource, and that they're goal-oriented, and that we give work to those committees that's relevant to decisions that are coming up for us right. in council. I'll give you a small example. We're in the process of renovating our LEP and our DCP. These are fundamental planning instruments that define the style of buildings that we want and where we want development and what the block sizes will be and which areas will be preserved as open space and so forth. Some of these documents haven't been re renovated for... Uh, uh, 2012 in the case of the LEP and maybe a decade even older than that in terms of the, the DCP. I want us to incorporate what are called design excellence principles in our LEP. And the simple way of explaining that is when we have um, a person putting in a DA, we don't want them to, to build the lowest common denominator. We want them to build something that's pleasant to look at, energy efficient, sympathetic with the landscape that it's set in, and we can't do that unless we get the right advice. Well, I want our Heritage Committee to deliver some wisdom about how we can incorporate design excellence principles into our LEP. But unless we're specific about giving our committees, including the Heritage Committee that I sit on and which does excellent work, unless we give them specific work and deadlines, I've tended to find they tend to sit and talk and talk, and talk. And, talk. <laughs> and we're talking about funding, that funding in that mix, Nathan, or...? Uh, um, well, I mean, you know... Uh, uh, are they volunteers, like the... No, no, all of, all, you know, uh, all of our uh, committees uh, have had, you know, volunteer contributions of one sort or another. We've streamlined that by saying that the voting members of those committees should be councillors, should be chaired by a councillor, and that we seek as much public participation as we can. Now... Some of my worthy colleagues will differ in their opinion about how much community consultation there is, but 
I'm telling people that this is better than what we had in the sense that we are now going to have committee meetings that have designated times, predictable times for their meeting, which have a published agenda, which will in specifically invite public comment when the agenda is known. None of those things were true before. And I was also pleased to be able to fight for the role of the Heritage Committee particularly because we have such a wonderful reservoir of expertise. People of, and I'm not exaggerating, international renown in the field of heritage architecture, heritage preservation, uh, environmental protection, all of, the, all of the expertise that if we had to pay for, I doubt we could afford. And these are people that give freely of their time. So I was keen to preserve the role of the Heritage Committee and its members so that it continues to act from time to time as the conscience of council. Some of my colleagues, I think, sticks in their crawl when council, when committees become a bit activist and, you know, put forward a contrary view. I think our shoulders are plenty broad enough to take yes. on that kind of opinion. Um, sometimes a committee acts as the conscience of a council and if it challenges us to value something more than we appear to be, I'm all for that. So we found the right balance. We found the right balance ultimately and that's what we've done to renovate our committee structures from 17 uh, down to four. Another thing that I want to talk about came up at our meeting just on Tuesday. So this is literally hot off the press. Many people would be aware that there's a proposed development at Glossodia at a place called Jacaranda. It was Jacaranda Ponds and then they changed their mind and they said it was just Jacaranda. And it's a 580 lot subdivision. Wow. That yes, was, I heard about this. Yeah. I mean, th this process kicked off in 2011, but the, there was a VPA, a voluntary planning agreement that was inked in 2017 and the process has dragged on and just recently on Tuesday we've um, voted to put on public exhibition a new VPA, a new planning agreement that alters some of the parameters. It's still 580 lots but there is now a much more generous contribution from the developer towards infrastructure. And it's keeping them honest. Remember we talked about Pitt Town where they reneged. Uh, that's that's correct. And the thing is, we can get into all kinds of trouble if we don't ink the right kinds of yep. voluntary planning agreements from the beginning and then, and, and then hold yeah. people to it. Yeah, so, for example, right. it's to the community's enormous benefit that the Red Bank developers yep. were contractually bound to build a bridge across the Gross River. Which has, still hasn't happened. Which still hasn't happened. But the thing is, nor are they off the hook. And I have been disappointed at the pace of that process yielding that piece of public infrastructure to the community's benefit. It's a nightmare up there. It's, it, it, it is, in the sense that you've, you've now got the development, but you don't have that critical piece of infrastructure that was promised to that community yes. to try and offset the additional wasn't, traffic. Wasn't it you let me build another 500 house and I'll give you a bridge? This well, sort of little bargy, so, bargy so, going so on what there? happened is that the, the thresholds, the thresholds in terms of the number of lots sold for them to be obliged to have their doc documentation and planning done to log their D DA, to put a shovel in the ground and then to complete the product. All of those um, thresholds were moved favourably. I don't know that I agreed with that, but nevertheless it was the view of the chamber that those thresholds should be moved. And now we're looking at locating the bridge in a different place, not at Navua Reserve, but at some other location, uh, we were hopeful that a new VPA that inked in that new location would have been complete by now. And I'm unhappy that the process has taken so long and those negotiations are, are still occurring. But in terms of Jacaranda at Glossodia, so most people would understand that the quality of a development depends very much on how much you spend on infrastructure per block. So... If you were selling a block of land for $300,000 and then you're going to spend money putting a house on top of that, a portion of that money is kept aside by the developer or given straight to council to do roads, footpaths, street lights, Very important. Uh, water reticulation, environmental protection, uh, um, uh, easements, drainage channels, uh, parks... Play, play equipment, all of those things that make a community pleasant are part of the money that's put aside per block. 
the previous VP8 Glossodia only put aside $30,000 for each block to do that essential infrastructure. Under the new VPA, that's been raised to 40000 and there are caps imposed by the state government on how much we can oblige a developer to pay. But I tend to compare that to what's being spent elsewhere, what other councils regard as the minimum amount that you should spend to get a good outcome for that development. So, for example, on the other side of Boundary Road, in Box Hill North and the Hills of Carmel and the Gables yes. and all the rest of it, they're spending on average anywhere between seventy and ninety thousand dollars per block. Wow, that's a forty. The infrastructure. That's a forty thousand dollar contribution from the developer, and then a top up of anywhere between thirty or forty five thousand dollars from the state government through their own pool of money for infrastructure. There was a scheme called LIGS, Local Infrastructure Growth Scheme, which meant that you could spend seventy thousand or more per block to get the right outcome. And I suspect that in those massive developments, they have significantly better economies of scale than we do in Glossodia, where we're doing 580 lots. I cannot understand why $40,000 is enough to spend on infrastructure to get all of those assets that the locals and the people moving into that area will expect to make it a quality development. And I lay the blame for this at the feet of the state government, who encourage us to meet our housing quotas, in fact, Im impose growth areas on us, like Vineyard Stage 1, yeah. and say, you will develop here, but then don't give us any money towards the infrastructure costs, don't give us any money to renovate our planning instruments so that we can ensure that what goes into those spaces represent the best urban communities that we could possibly design, and then people get cranky that the roads are so narrow that the garbage trucks can't get through or that the uh, bus stops aren't placed in a convenient location for people to be able to walk to. It's very poor. You can only get it, you've got to get it right the first time, haven't you, Nathan? Or the, or the, or the parks don't have enough play yeah. equipment yeah. For, for young kids. And I think we're learning very belatedly that, you know, greenfield development and urban carve-up like this yields a very poor result for the community in the long term. Some people heedlessly say, oh, you know, councils are in favour of development because it's a river of gold. It's far from it. It costs council and it costs the rest of the community. State government gets the money. Into an enormous amount of money to put a new, you know, greenfield development in. Mm. And that's why our own local housing strategy doesn't favour greenfield development. So we've now endorsed our local housing strategy and it, in, it encourages us to do infill development, to build up our town centres, to have more medium density, closer to our nodes of public transport, like train stations and so forth, not to do what we're seeing elsewhere with mass subdivision. And of course, the, a community that is caught right in the middle of that debate are the people just on this side of Boundary Road in Oakville, Moralia and Vineyard, mm who are either going to endure development because of what's already being gazetted or think that there should be development in those remaining areas that are um, RU2, RU4, five-acre lots, you know, traditional house. Land valuations have gone through the roof. Their land valuations have skyrocketed and some people are paying double or more than double yep. the, 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 the council rates, and we've discussed this before, than they had before mm. when their ability to pay hasn't changed. And their access to services is no better than anybody else's access to services. And indeed, many would say poorer, because if you look at the state of Oakville Oval, or you look at the state of some of our local roads that are full of potholes, or a very highly traffic road like Brendan's Dam Road, Old Stockroot Road, or Commercial yeah. Road, that is still dirt after all this time, despite being a major arterial route out of those suburbs, and for people to get onto the Windsor Road, you know leaves them justifiably aggrieved about the rates that they're paying and what they get in return for their rate dollar. So I wanted to cool the debate. There are people in Oakville who are in favour of development and there are people who would fight to their dying breath to preserve the semi-rural amenity. I have my own views on this subject. I'm not particularly in favour of subdivision or development but I want to be a good and diligent representative for that community. So 
I suggested when we were looking at our land strategy that we should ask that community, that we should survey them, that we should do the kind of community consultation that we did in Courage on Kermond when we were looking at the style of development that might occur up that way. Excellent work, by the way. And I was voted down. I and my Liberal colleagues were in favour of asking the actual community whether they were on balance in favour of development, and if they were, what kind of development that means. It doesn't necessarily mean 1,000 square metre blocks with no yards, no trees, and black roofs, and no eaves, and walls that are so close together you could reach out and steal your neighbour's yes, shampoo. Yes, too much of that. Mm. But people might be in favour of us advocating for detached dual occupancy, in other words, putting two houses on one block, but under the same title. Right. So that parents can give a leg up to their kids and kids can look after their elderly parents on the same property. Or they might want us to do a large lot subdivision like we see over in Windsor Downs. And the thing is, we won't know what the whole of that community wants because some of my council colleagues were against even asking the question. And I rather think we should ask the question. 